Hey, it's me, that food you got delivered to your place. I know that you are very excited to eat me and you are about to bask in the glory of food that you didn't have to cook yourself. But you know what could bring out my flavors and make me taste even better? How about while you're eating, you listen to an episode of this podcast? Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, I just wanted to touch on next week's episode of Potterless, which will be covering the Potter Puppet Pals videos. You can find these videos on YouTube. We'll be talking about four of them. These are the four original ones posted on Neil, the creator's YouTube channel, and they're also the four with the most views, I'm pretty sure. But here are the titles of the four videos we will be covering in case you wanted to watch them before the episode comes out. Potions Class, Wizard Angst, The Mysterious Ticking Noise, and Wizard Swears. So those are the four, and I'm very excited for you all to hear that episode. Something else I'm very excited about is the four-year anniversary of Potterless is coming up soon in October, and we are going to be doing something special for it. I'll be discussing this further on social media, so just make sure you're following Potterless on Twitter, at PotterlessPod, or on Instagram, at PotterlessPodcast, so you don't miss that announcement. I'm very excited about it. It's going to involve of listening back to old episodes of Potterless. Ah. And you know what else else has me excited? People keeping the show going. We have a whole bunch of new patrons over at our team over at patreon.com slash Potterless that I want to give a shout out to. So shout out to Fallon Orkurto, Sarah Burton, Lindsay Mears, Shira Goldine, Tori Wilson, Meg Reinhardt, Tanya Josso, Nathan Stefani, Isla Lee, Noemi, Lindsay Barnes, and the return of Danielle Goybolt. And a huge shout out to our newest producer level patron, Mary Price. They join the ranks of Vicky, Christine, Aaron, Clown, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Rosemary, Marie, Lisa, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Ali, Sarah, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, The Owl, Moster, Alex, John, Noel, Brandon, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Maya, Flor, Siri, Georgia, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Michael, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Aurora, Marcos, Marique, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Heather, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Jarl, Peter, Sophie, Jen, and Callahan, Leah, Melissa, Bella, Melanie, Becca, Reese, Adam, Joseph, Lily's mom, T Run, Madison, Tonk, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, Matt, Okamahime, Bony Pony, Kelsey, Rike, Taylor, Rochelle, Megan, Alicia, Riley, Laurel, Ross, Ann, Erica, Miranda, Landon, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Sandra, Craig, Andren, Steve, Lior, Julia, Demi, Michelle, Callista, Lovekesh, Jennifer, Crystal, Henrique, Jeremy, Delkis, Katrina, Jerrica, Casey, Megan, Zat, Jack, Sophia, Dan, Rochelle, Kirstie, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Daddykins, Aaron, Not My Daughter, Yupiach, Alaria, Lori, Gregory, Krista, Kaka, Nina, Ribbon, Brittany, It's Definitely Ludo, Bagman, Ravenclaw, Gavin, Ashley, Grant, Aaliyah, Jack, Serenity, Emily, Haley, Sabrina, Malfoy, Sean, Jenny, Laura, Ella, Eileen, Annette, Kirsten, Ann, Nosh, Brett, Hunter, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never forget to bring their headphones when they leave their apartment for a lengthy walk outside. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus content like bonus episodes, director's commentary, monthly live streams, exclusive merchandise, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 145 of Potterless, the final episode covering Quidditch through the ages, guest starring Jania Stewart from House of Black. So let's go on to chapter eight, which is the spread of Quidditch worldwide. This chapter, I think, had me the most excited at the start and then the most disappointed as I went through, because unfortunately, every section is just like, here's another country. They don't like Quidditch that much either. Right, right. First, it talks about Europe. Quidditch went from England to then Norway and then to France and then throughout the rest of Europe. 1473 was that first World Cup. It was only European teams. This is the one with all of those 700 fouls. Some of these fouls include an attempted decapitation of the keeper with a broadsword, and one was a player released 100 blood-sucking bats, and yes, they were on the Transylvanian team. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's fucking funny. That's funny. Like, that was good. I enjoyed this joke. That's hilarious. I love it. Like, I think it's, I think it's hilarious. My question, though, where do you hide 100 bats? Where do you hide a broadsword? <laughs> Better question. <laughs> Where do you hide a broad sword? Like, what has to happen in order for you to be on a broom in the midst of a game and be like, you know what? I'm gonna take a broad sword out. Like, <laughs> is that in the air? Like, I guess. What? I guess you gotta have one of those Hermione bag of holding things where the bag is smaller than the object that you're taking out of it. <gasps> I just had an idea. Okay. What if the person who was nearly decapitated was nearly headless? <laughs> Ooh, I think that the canon said it was something else. I think it was a duel, but I like this headcanon better. What if he lied and said it was a duel so like mm. people wouldn't make fun of him? He was embarrassed. Yes, imagine telling people you were almost decapitated in a Quidditch game. Mm. By some, like people are going to go, what? I like but it. But if you say it was a duel, it's like all noble and it's- Yeah, 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 How yeah. old is he like? 
the 1600s or something. So it makes sense if people think it's a duel. But like when I read that just now, I was like, oh my goodness. I just imagine like nearly headless Nick flying around in like his pompous clothing and like <laughs> the dude just with the broad sword is like, you should not be wearing that at Quidditch and then tries to kill him. <laughs> So it goes on to list some teams in some other countries, and it's even shorter than the English and Irish section. So I'll just talk about some notable stuff. The most notable from this laundry list is there's a French team that wears bright pink robes. Fascinating. Love it. So then they talk about Australia and New Zealand, and it was spread to Europe by herbologists that were studying fungi who wanted to let off some steam in the 18th century. This just feels very sus to me. Like, I'm just like, okay, Australia started as like a a penal colony for the British. Mm. So what if it was like a bunch of like Quidditch players who were in jail or something, (laughs) just a bunch of like minor league or whoever, and they're like playing in jail or something. But I just, I was like, herbologists, really? Like... Do the herbologists really seem like the Quidditch playing sort of people? <laughs> Neville Longbottom, noted Quidditch a athlete. Noted Quidditch star. <laughs> I also learned a new word from this book, Antipodean. It just means from Australia and slash or New Zealand, which I thought was very cool. I've, ne- I've literally never seen this word before. I Googled it, and that's what Google told me. So I learned a new word. At least something good came of this book. <laughs> Hooray! (laughs) I want to just say that the next section after this just pissed me off because it's like Africa. Uh, The whole continent of Africa. And it's like two paragraphs. (laughs) What? (sighs) Seriously? You know, soccer is really big over there too, you know? So like, why would Quidditch not be very popular over there as well? Like, they were like, oh... The broomstick was introduced to the African continent by European wizards and witches traveling there in search of information on alchemy and astronomy. Okay. Sure, Jan. They do, <laughs> they do try to throw Africa some love by saying that the African wizards were very good at alchemy and astronomy. But yeah, it's the classic white people shit of pretending Africa is a country. Instead of an entire continent that's not just the same in every single part of it. Right. And I just think like the part of saying like, oh, these Europeans, they just came here for info on astronomy and alchemy. And I'm like, no, (laughs) no, no, (laughs) that that does not work here because we know what they really came over there for. And it wasn't fucking astronomy. So like this is just so I was just like I put like side eye emojis when I highlighted this. (laughs) Because I was like, yeah, okay, all right, astronomy and alchemy, sure. But I do love that the Uganda team is like, they're pretty good. And they said like they held another team um, to like a tie or something. And that the rest of the Quidditch people were like, whoa, it's going down in Uganda, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they could have given more information about the different parts of Africa and how Quidditch was, you know, maybe it was different in Egypt than South Africa. I don't know, but it, it felt very unilaterally like Africa treated Quidditch all the exact same. This giant mass of land all felt equal about Quidditch. Right. There's no variations in play. And that's the other thing, too, is like, I feel like Quidditch is like Uno. <laughs> Everybody plays it differently. No one pays any attention to the rules. In fact, they throw them in the trash. But like, you cannot tell me that in Africa, Quidditch is not like a wild, like just amazing spectacle of of sport. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm thinking halftime shows. I'm thinking, oh. you know, There's probably all these really beautiful, like, uniform designs, and the mascots are probably baller as hell. Like, imagine you have, like, the Johannesburg elephants or something. No, no, no. It has to start with a J. They have to be the Johannesburg Jaguars. Oh, yeah. The Johannesburg. You are absolutely right. The Ethiopian (laughs) elephants are probably going to work. But, like, how cool would that be? And then they just had, like, animals, but, like, in Patronus form or something, just running around and Everybody gets sees like little fireworks, like animals. That would be so cute. And I'm just like, the African countries would really act up with Quidditch. Like, it's probably a good thing that they're not super big into it because they really would take the whole game and just turn it into something so much more fun, I think. Yeah, it would have been great. But hey, maybe you could write that book. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> so as I noted, the same problem in the British and Irish section persists in this world section where every single team is alliteration. So I'm just going to laundry list through the names 
the Vrasta Vultures, the Quiberon Quaffle Punchers, the Heidelberg Harriers, the Biggenville Bombers, the Braga Broomfleet, the Godzik Goblins, the Mutahora Macaws, the Thundalara Thunderers, which is just incredibly unimaginative, the Wollongong Warriors, the Patunga Proudsticks, the Chamba Charmers, the Gimbi Giant Slayers, the Sumba Wanga Sunrays, the Moose Jaw Meteorites, the Haleybury Hammers, the Stonewall Stormers, the Fitchburg Finches, the Tarapoto Tree Skimmers, and the Toyoshi Tengu. Fascinating. Incredibly interesting. I will say there is one other team that does not have an alliteration name, and they are from the Texas area of the United States. They are the Sweetwater All-Stars, <laughs> which is nothing. That is nothing. Sweetwater is nothing. And the All-Stars... It doesn't feel like true to Texas. No. Like, Texas wouldn't ever. They'd pr it'd probably be like, you know, some Longhorn-related thing. Like, I don't know, the Texas, like, whatever starts with a T in Texas. I don't know. But, like, Sweetwater? Texas mm -hmm. would never. <laughs> they would never do something like this. Sweetwater, they would never do that. All-Stars doesn't make sense because usually an all-star team is when you take players from lots of different teams and put them together. That is the definition of what an all-star team is. But also, you're right. Think of Texas's current teams. The football team in Houston, Texas is called the Houston Texans. Yes. Like, and they used to be called the Houston Oilers because, you know, oil and gas and the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers like <laughs> Dallas Mavericks like it all ties in but like this I'm like this is not Texas she's she's been told a lie about Texas right and even when Texas teams have creative names they are very regionally based the Houston Astros and the Houston Rockets are both because Houston went to space and the Houston Dynamo energy the energy corridor in Houston at least it has some sort of regional connection yes the Sweetwater All-Stars is nothing. I felt personally offended by this. <laughs> yeah, we both lived in Texas for at least a decade each. I feel bad for the state of Texas. They deserve better. Also, this sentence that only two teams in the entire, uh, in all of America, Ugh. that seems very suspect to me. It seemed like she was trying to make fun of America for being bad at soccer. Probably. And you know, that may be it. That may be it. But I'm just thinking like, the only two are from Texas and Massachusetts. Are you serious? Yeah, you know, the two places in America. Right, just those two places. What I would have loved if she was trying to make fun of America's soccer, it would have been very funny if America had two teams. One was an all-boys team that was ass, and one was an all-girls team that never loses, <laughs> because <laughs> that would have been very American. I love it. That would have been perfect. So yes, the next section is North America. It says Canada caught the Quidditch bug, but the U.S. not so much because they had a popular broom game called quad pot and quad pot is 11 on 11 where people try to get an exploding quaffle into a pot before it explodes this was created by a guy accidentally poking a hole in his quaffle when he was trying to teach it to people and then trying to play it off as if he meant to do it this very much feels like her trying to make fun of american football absolutely i get it i would agree that american football is way 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 worse than real foot ball soccer as we like to call it in this neck of the woods i agree american football i think is garbage but uh i don't agree with the notion that i mean maybe but like soccer's still big here it's just not as big i don't know you're right having having like two teams be good was strange yeah it's it's just odd to me like this is also another thing that people talked about more so when she talked about like which schools existed like in america and there's only one and it's that like ilver morning whatever and i'm like do you understand how big the united states is so, like <laughs> there only being one school makes absolutely no sense like it just makes not an ounce of sense so i think this is like the same thing where it's just like i don't really know how big it is for real for real so i'm just gonna make some shit up and no one's going to try me because I'm richer than God, so it's fine. <laughs> the more I think about the schools throughout the world thing, the less sense it makes. Because if you think of it from the perspective of there's only seven schools or however many there are, so they're spread out over the world, that could make sense. But then when you think about it further, having one school for all of North America and then having three schools in Europe, like we have a French school and an English school that like then it gets thrown out the window. Yeah, and they're right across the bridge from each other, you know, so it's just like <laughs> this it's 
all very sus. It's all very <laughs> like, I, I'm like, oh, cool, American school. And then I click it and I'm like, so you mean to tell me that it's not Salem and it's not in New Orleans? It's just random ass, whatever the fuck this <laughs> is. Are you serious? And Native Americans, what are those? What are those? Oh my God. <laughs> I was going to do episodes before J.K. Rowling became her, her final form, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I was going to do episodes about Alpha Morty, but I was afraid because people told me like, yo, she really yada yada is over Native Americans existing. And now I don't have to read it. Yay! Wonderful. Wonderful. <sighs> so South America also has the quad pot issue of that's more popular so they aren't as good at Quidditch. This feels incredibly unfair for trying to make Quidditch similar to soccer because South America has so many incredible teams. But I do love the note, and shout out to longtime listener and producer level patron Klaus Lopu. She says that Peru is like really fucking good at Quidditch just out of the blue. And I do like this. I think it's fun to just say that Quidditch isn't really popular in this entire continent, but this one country loves it. I think that's so fun. <laughs> yeah. This other one, too, I was just like, mm. so it says that the Peruvians were introduced to it when uh, European wizards were sent by the International Confederation to monitor the number of viper tooth dragons. And this was another situation where I'm like, when the Europeans came to Peru, it wasn't to monitor dragons. It was <laughs> to kill things and kill people. Like, this doesn't <laughs> why. Look, we have to believe that witches were always nice, unlike English muggles who did all the bad stuff. Right. I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like, this, what? This is so odd to me, but it's like another blind spot that is just like, you can't just say these things. Like, it doesn't work here, at least, you know, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying like, okay, they were exposed to it when, you know, the Europeans tried to come over and steal all their shit. And some of those people happened to be wizards who were fucking flying around. Because like, if you think about it, in Central America, like in, I think it's like the Mayans or the Aztecs had this game where they used to like try to kick a ball through these hoops that were like attached to a wall or something. I can't think of like what the name of it is, but if you've ever seen, I've, I think I've seen drawings of it before. Yeah, yeah. If you've seen like that movie, The Road to El Dorado, oh, classic. Yeah, there's like a part where like uh, one of the dudes gets challenged to like play this game, and they have to kick this ball into these enormous holes that are really high up. So it's like soccer plus Quidditch at the same time. And I'm just thinking like they already had a game like this, so why would they <laughs> be introduced to it at all? They had a game that was very similar, so like. What if they came over and they're like, oh my gosh, you guys had Quidditch? And they're like, oh, that's what you guys call it? We call it <laughs> different. Like, that would have been pretty cool to see. Yeah, it is strange that none of the other countries where it spread to had a similar game. Because I feel like that happens with some sports. Yes, for sure. Especially soccer. I mean, like, kicking a Kick ball. ball through thing. Who has not thought about that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It does feel like in this book, they are very much trying to just pretend British imperialism didn't happen. That was a British muggle thing, not a British wizard thing at all, we promise. Right, right. So then we finally get to Asia, which felt gross because they were just like, Quidditch isn't popular here because of the carpets. Like, we're back on the carpet bullshit. Like, what? Are you serious? You really think, like, that China is using flying carpets? They're probably using literal fucking dragons to play Quidditch. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Like Quidditch on dragons. Yes, and all the Quidditch matches like probably happen in like the fucking Himalayas or like Mount Fuji or something really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're playing like mountain snow Quidditch, you know, something like that. I just refuse to believe that the entirety of Asia is using flying carpets. And also the flying carpet just as a thing to be assigned to Asia is just incredibly problematic just on its own you know how south korea is the same thing as saudi arabia you know right and i'm just thinking also like this is another thing where i feel like soccer is really popular in uh like west asia like arabian peninsula the middle east whatever soccer is pretty popular there too so like why would quidditch not achieve the same level of popularity because carpets <laughs> because the carpets and and also like the, why would they let the carpets stop them they right. were still doing it <laughs> They would still do it. It's not like you it, You can still play Quidditch. You don't have to be on a broom, I don't think, right? Was that one of the rules that we forgot? The only way it would make sense is if you had to use your feet, because if you're riding or 
sitting on a carpet, your feet are occupied. But in Quidditch, you use your hands. Your hands are still free if you're riding on a magic carpet. Yes, I just, I refuse to believe that, like, it's just Quidditch is not popping in Asia at all. Because actually, much like Africa and the Americas, I really do think that, like, everywhere else in the world is playing Quidditch better than it's being played in England. Like, I feel like if you were from England and you were, like, a witch or wizard, you'd go to a Quidditch game in, like, Shanghai and just be like, whoa. It's like going to Disney World in Shanghai. Like, the fireworks, elite. <laughs> like, you're not going to be fireworks <laughs> like that anywhere else. Like, I'm just thinking about it, like, in those terms. And I've just come to the conclusion that, like, I... I would rather see a Quidditch book from someone else that is not from Europe at all, or even not even from the UK, like just to see what the differences would be. Yeah, maybe this Kenilworthy Wisp character is not trustworthy. Yes, this Kenilworthy Wisp. <laughs> Ooh, new headcanon. This is all propaganda. He's lying, and this textbook, which is in Hogwarts, is just telling lies, which feels on brand for textbooks. And also on brand Specifically for history textbooks. <laughs> Also very on brand for Hogwarts as well. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently Japan loves Quidditch. They also do this absolutely incredible thing where if they lose a match, they set their brooms on fire. That's got to be expensive. That's an expensive habit to have. It's very expensive. It is very cool optic wise. Doesn't seem to make a lot of logistical sense. And the Quidditch Federation would agree with that notion because they think that this is a waste of perfectly good brooms. So I actually think like, how cool would it be if they took like the ashes from their burnt brooms? I don't even know how brooms are made, but like, what if they took the ashes from all of their previous brooms mm -hmm. and then like for champion season or playoff season, they get like new brooms that are made of the ashes from all their burned brooms throughout the season. I like it. Or those ashes become flu powder. Oh. Ooh, I wonder how flu powder made of burnt broom dust would, like, change things. I don't know. Maybe that's how they finally learn how to fly. Maybe. Oh, that's Voldemort's secret. They get launched instead of going down the fireplace, they get launched up the fireplace. I like it. I like it. I really like it too, Pass Mike. Hey, it's me, Editing Mike. How's it going, everybody? You know what else I really like? I like the segment where we get to talk about people who are keeping the show going. So let's take a little bit of a break for Wingardium Adoridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Calm. Let's say hypothetically that you are me, Mike Schubert, and you have had to do multiple episodes of your podcast about something that you genuinely despise. You need to try to de-stress before you can go to sleep. You need to calm yourself down before you hit the hay. What could you do to calm yourself down? You could use the app Calm. Calm is the app designed to help you ease stress and get the best sleep of your life. When you relieve anxiety... You can improve your sleep, and then you'll feel better in every part of your life. I can say this from experience as someone that is now entering the getting older phase of my 20s, where I am realizing, oh no, I can't stay up as late as I used to, and so much of the productivity of the following day is based on how good my sleep is. So Calm is super clutch to make sure that you get great sleep. Calm has a whole library of programs designed for healthy sleep. They have soundscapes, guided meditations, and over 100 sleep stories narrated by soothing voices like Stephen Fry, Kelly Rowland, and Laura freaking Dern. Over 85 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds and get better sleep. And if you go to calm.com slash Potterless, you can get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription. That is correct. Potterless listeners, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Potterless. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire existing library and new content is added every week. So get started today at calm.com slash Potterless. That's calm.com slash Potterless. You'll save 40% and you can calm down before you go to sleep after covering such rage inducing material on your podcast for the past few weeks. Today! Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Blaseball. Let's say hypothetically that you are me, Mike Schubert, and you are covering a bad fictional sport, Quidditch, on your podcast, but you want to be a part of a good fictional sport in your free time. What could that good fictional sport be? It's Blaseball. Blaseball takes the general structure of baseball, the sport, but then gets rid of all the boring stuff and adds in truly ridiculous and wonderful and absurd things to create just the most fun internet sports league imaginable. It's completely free. It's not pay to play at all. You literally can't give money to make yourself better at the game. You can support them on Patreon, but there's no microtransactions or anything like that. It's just a genuine fun time on the internet. You pick a team to support, you root for that team, you can bet on your own team, and you can bet on the outcomes of other games to earn more coins, and you can idolize players either on your team or on other teams throughout the league to earn even more coins. 
The team names are great. My favorite team, the best team is the Breckenridge Jazz Hands, but there are also the Hades Tigers and the Unlimited Tacos and the Miami Dale and the Hellmouth Sunbeams. So many wonderful teams. And these teams have great players with wonderful names such as Jessica Telephone, Randall Marijuana, Comfort Septemberish, Cannonball Sports, and more. And there's just other little absurd things like one of the weather settings for the game is birds. And yes, that will affect the outcome of a game. So if you want to check out Blazeball, go to Blazeball.com, B-L-A-S-E-B-A-L-L.com. Pick a team to support. You probably should pick the Breckenridge Jazz Hands. You're allowed to pick any team you want, but I will be upset if you pick any other team. And then just start having a good old time. If you're listening to this on the week that this episode released, Blazeball is taking a break so that they can add even more new features. So be aware of that. But yeah, go to blazeball.com and start having a good time on the Breckenridge Jazz Hands today. And finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by BetterHelp. Let's say hypothetically that you are me, Mike Schubert, and you have to cover Quidditch on your podcast multiple times. It's not a great experience for you. You are frustrated because the content you're covering is something you really don't like. What's a way that you could get out your feelings about this? You could talk to a licensed professional with BetterHelp. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist with whom you can start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide. It's not just an America thing. And you are getting the advantage of not being restricted to whatever therapy situation is close to you locally. You can receive help that you might not have been able to get otherwise. And you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home. You don't have to deal with commutes. You don't have to deal with awkward waiting rooms. You can do it from the comfort of your couch in whatever clothes you want to wear. You don't have to dress up. Keep your sweatpants on. With your counselor, you will get timely and thoughtful responses. And you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, whatever makes the most sense for you. If you want to hear reviews about people using BetterHelp, you can go to BetterHelp.com slash reviews to see what people are saying about it. And if you go to BetterHelp.com slash Potterless, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Potterless, you can join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced licensed professional, and you'll get 10% off your first month. So again, that is BetterHelp.com slash Potterless. You'll get 10% off your first month, and you can start talking with a licensed professional very quickly. And, you know, if you got to vent out your feelings about Quidditch, this could be it. You could do that by going to BetterHelp.com slash Potterless today. So then we get into chapter nine, which is the development of the racing broom. Apparently there was a cushioning charm in 1820 that made riding more comfortable. And the little figure in the book, which I think J.K. Rowling drew, made me laugh so hard because it it's this dopey little drawing <laughs> of a broom with a what looks like just a chair or a couch cushion on top of it. And then <laughs> and then there's a little handwritten note that in parentheses says invisible. <laughs> As if that wasn't apparent. Uh, it's so whack. It looks so ridiculous. I actually think it's kind of odd that brooms don't have like seats in the way that like bikes do. Oh, they've got invisible couch cushions on them. Who needs it? And I have to assume also that there have to be brooms that are kind of like Harley Davidson level where it's like, it's not a, exactly a bike, but it's like a motorbike. Like, is there a motor broom with like a, a mm. seat on it? You know, maybe a little sidecar or something like <laughs> that. So they go on in the history of brooms to talk about how we got to the point we are now with your Nimbus 2000s and stuff. There was an original broom called the Oak Shaft 79. It was this old broom that was fast, but it couldn't really handle very well. Then there was the Moon Trimmer, which could go a lot higher vertically, but demand exceeded supply. So this poor woman, Gladys, that invented it just stopped and went out of business because she couldn't keep up with demand, which I don't know that that makes sense. But yeah, she just got too overwhelmed. So stopped making brooms. That seems strange, honestly. Like, I feel like you would just become a... I'm trying to think of... When you buy like really nice woodworking stuff, like how Nick Offerman has that wood shop and he makes $500 tables that I would never buy, but someone's going to buy it. If demand is really high and supply is low, you just charge more per broom. Yeah, which means you'll get like less people beating down your door for it. But like I this this also brings me back to the question of like, how exactly are these made? Like, mm -hmm. are they made like wands where like the kind of wood changes what kind of broom it'll be? Like what what is the thing here? How are the how are made because it seems like people are just randomly popping up and starting broom businesses but like how do you even do this see jenia that would have been actually interesting to read but no they don't talk about how brooms are made they just talk about like the history of broom companies and what pretty much happens is you have another person they make this silver arrow it could go up to 70 miles an hour but again the whole demand thing happened so the winner of the broom industry is just corporations 
It just says that no one could keep up with demand until the Allerton brothers founded the Clean Sweep Company. So it's like capitalism is what made brooms good. It, I don't. It's just. It's so weird to read a book that instead of learning, oh, I wonder how brooms are made. It's no, no, no. These independent people tried to make brooms, but those dweebs couldn't keep up with demand. Thank goodness for businesses. <laughs> right. Like, I I was so confused. It felt like a lot like, you know, if brooms had like a Nike or Adidas or Under Armour kind of moment. <laughs> like, it sounds like all these brooms are just made by like that one company and like they have like monopoly over everything. Mm -hmm. I really need to know more about how the brooms are made. That's sticking to me. Do the Ollivander people like ever consult on <laughs> which woods are good for handling because if you have to consider which kinds of wood make for a good wand I assume you have to consider what kinds of wood would make a good broom right yeah that would be very interesting but alas not in this book I just go to Home Depot and get the materials <laughs> and go so yeah there's a couple notes about the innovations of brooms made but it's just talking about like what each new model could do there is one thing that I find funny is one of the companies the Comet Company their first broom was called the Comet 140 and yes, 140 is the number that they tested until they finally got one that they liked, which I always appreciated because when I made YouTube videos, my account name was Shoob17, and people used to be like, oh, what? It was? Did you make 16 other channels that didn't get popular? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I love it. 17 is just my favorite number. So we get into the final chapter of this garbage book, which is Quidditch Today. And all it is is a glossary of terms that are moves that people do in Quidditch now, and they're not particularly interesting. And uh, a lot of them have alliteration. Shocking. So here's what we've got. We've got the bludger backbeat, which is just hitting the bludger behind you. We have the doppelbeater defense, which is when both beaters hit a bludger at the same time, which is physically impossible. Like that is so laughably impossible. Can you imagine two people swinging clubs and hitting the same ball at the same time and actually steering where it goes? Yeah, I read this as like two bludgers hitting like, or two beaters hitting the bludgers like at each other. So like the bludgers collide and make like a, a thing. But yeah, I think what you're saying is probably right. But when I read it, I just, my mind was like, that doesn't make sense. It has to be them just like hitting, <laughs> but nothing makes sense. So it probably is the thing that doesn't make any sense. Yours sounds cooler and makes more sense. But yeah, the book says both beaters hit a bludger at the same time for extra power. That doesn't work. That does not work at all. It's not, you can't charge them up. Like it's not really how that works. <laughs> then there is the double eight loop, which is a keeper just swerving in between all the goalposts. I guess that's fine, but that, that just feels like normal defense of staying in front of all the goalposts. Then there's something very cool, the hawk head attacking formation, which is basically the flying V for Mighty Ducks. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Like, I'm just imagining, like, if you were playing Quidditch and, like, the whole team just looks like they're about to attack you, like, you're just like, whoa. Terrifying. Where's all this activity coming from? So intimidating. Then there is a move called the Parkins Pincer. It is when two chasers sandwich an opponent chaser. They fly on each side of an opponent chaser and kind of ram them together. And then the third chaser flies directly at that opponent. Now, three chapters ago, we had a rule that explicitly stated, you can't do this. So I don't get why this is an official move. It's because it's J.K. Rowling. Ah, yes, 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 yes. of course, of course, of course. Yes. Then there's something called the Plumpton Pass, which is catching the snitch in your sleeve. Cool, I guess. Then there's the Parskoff play. It's when the chaser flies up like they are trying to score, but then throws it directly down vertically to a teammate. This also could be called passing. <laughs> I don't understand what about this maneuver is so unique that it is its own play. It just feels like a very normal strategy is pretend I'm going to score, but then pass it. But, like That's what passing is in soccer. All of this just feels like regular things that I would expect yeah. when playing the sport to do. <laughs> <laughs> the glossary, the dictionary of Quidditch is just so lengthy because everything has its own unique name. Everything. Sometimes things don't need names. Sometimes mm -hmm. things just should exist. Such as the reverse pass, capital R, capital P. Guess what that is? Throwing it behind you. <laughs> this is actually the only move in the whole book that is named after the thing that it is. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's exactly what, it, what you think it is. The next one, I actually got to hand it to her. It's actually pretty cool. It's called the sloth grip roll. You hang upside down off of your broom to dodge a bludger. So it's like just your feet on the broom, which I think is pretty cool. And then the next one is also sweet. It's the starfish and stick. It's a 
keeper move where you have one arm and one leg on the broom so that you can lean really far over and block the quaffle with the other hand. This kind of stuff I think is creative. I would have loved a whole chapter about keepers because I think inherently being a goalkeeper and you have to defend three goals from someone flying at you, that seems really interesting. I would love to know who drew the picture for this because what the hell is happening? <laughs> I think JK Rowling did these drawings because I've seen other doodles that she has done and it looks pretty similar. I also think that this book did not have an editor because these drawings are horrible. Horrifying. Horrifying. It, they <laughs> literally called her in like the middle of the night and were like, hey, can you just throw something together? And she's like, cool, got you, no problem. I think what it was is she drew them first and she's like, wasn't this great? And then her publishers who only saw dollar signs were like, yeah, okay. it's so cute. <laughs> it's great. We love it. It's so wonderful. It's so uh, whimsical. It's so different. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's the Transylvanian tackle, which is pretending to punch someone in the nose. What? <laughs> How is that a tactic? How is this okay? How is this so special that it's listed as an official strategy or technique? Why is it called a tackle if no one is getting tackled? Right. Then there's the Wulongong Shimmy, which is named after that other team, and it's just flying in a zigzag formation. So again, why does this have to be defined? And then the final term listed is the Ronsky Faint, which we know is the thing that happened in the World Cup in Goblet of Fire. It's literally the only thing that I recognize. <laughs> yeah, it's the only thing that's actually been named before. And it's also the only one that kind of makes sense. That move is something that is so unique and so dramatic, and it's named after the person who did it. That actually makes sense. These other things, just aside from the Flying V, maybe, they don't seem like they really need to be named. I don't know. Then there's an about the author section, but it wasn't interesting, so I took no notes. And that is the end of Quidditch Through the Ages. Thank Christ. Oh, God. I feel like my brain is, like, just squishy <laughs> and, like, just falling out of my nose at the moment. Like I was going to ask you how you feel, but uh, I feel like that sums it up perfectly. <laughs> As I read this, I was like, I hate that we keep getting books like this about, like, shit in this universe that we truly don't care about. And we still, to this day, have not gotten a book about the founders. Like, that's the thing that I want to know the most about. What is going on? Like, can this be like a like a George Lucas thing where, like, she sells the rights and, like, someone else starts writing, like, someone else starts writing Star Wars books. It's not George Lucas, but, like, Star Wars books are still being written by other people. Like, mm -hmm. can that hurry up and happen so I can write this book? I have it all planned out. I know exactly what I want. Salazar Slytherin is a Spaniard. I won't be convinced of anything else. Like, I, I have his backstory planned out, okay? I have it mapped. Just call me. Like, I got it. I got it on deck. Make it happen. Yes. As much as I hate Quidditch, I wanted this book to be fun. It could have been fun. It had glimmers of hope, mainly in the chapters where we start learning about the world around Quidditch. Yeah. And I think what it really boils down to is that this book is like 100 pages, but I would say about 20 of them are blank and like chapter filling stuff. So it's maybe 75 pages and you've got 10 chapters. It just seems like she's trying to do too many things where it just becomes a bunch of short bursts of information about a lot of stuff. Whereas if you just whittle it down to how Quidditch was founded, how Quidditch is in the world now and maybe some things about how the sport developed over time, I feel like that would have been fine. But it just doesn't focus in depth enough about the interesting elements, and it has too much time on things that just aren't fun. And don't even matter. Like, yeah. I don't care about the Quidditch moves. I don't. I, like, I would assume a book called Quidditch Through the Ages is a history book. Yeah. Maybe not because I have two degrees in history, but like, I would assume based on the title that that is what it would be. I didn't think it would be like some weird Wikipedia of like anything associated with Quidditch at all. I hated it. I feel like I lost valuable brain cells that I can't get back. <laughs> um, Every brain cell you lost by reading it, we gained as friendship cells yes. by sharing the truest form of friendship, which is making fun of something or someone that you both hate. You know, the real <laughs> Quidditch through the ages is the friends we make. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's my favorite thing ever. That's the best way to end it. So, JD, thank you so much for joining. If people want to find you doing stuff on the internet, podcast-wise, whatever, where can they do so? Um, you can follow my personal account at the lady underscore Artemis, and you can follow the podcast account at House of Black Pod on Twitter and on Instagram as well at House of Black Pod. And if you ever want to send emails or share thoughts about the podcast, you can email House of Black Pod at gmail.com. British listeners that were upset by this episode, send your emails to Jania. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to have to set up an auto filter to just have them push right to your inbox if they come through my way. It's going to be the Greeks. They're going to be like, it's me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Gosh. Well, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thanks for listening. And as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they do a, uh, before they do a Plumpton Pass, <laughs> wizard on. <laughs> Hey, if you're thinking of making a podcast of your own or you're already doing one and you'd like some advice, Multitude has a whole bunch of resources available for you at multitude.production slash resources. Every time we do something at a convention or give some sort of talk, we put it up there so you can find a wonderful treasure trove of info at multitude.production slash resources. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Christine, Aaron Johnson, Klaus Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfeliu, Rosemary Dodge, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Romina Riv De Niro, Audra, Ellen Rokerlin, Nikita to power, Ali Madsen, Sarah Nink, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orchid Grower, Vivian the Owl, Moster, Alex Consolver, John Cocker, Noel Basile, Brandon Pickens, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark Lou, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosanowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda Alford, Kafir Shaltiel, Sarah Shatter, Marta Morris, and Maya Flor Sake, Siri Scaros for Georgia Davis, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Bienkowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lentz, Aurora Fruha, Marco Cepeda, Marie Krieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Heather Langeal, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tiu, Charles Fiven, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jen and Rose Dab, Callahan and Darius, Leah Reed, Melissa, Rob, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Lily's Mom, T Run Money, Madison, Don't Call Me an Infidora, Sabrina Balsiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie DeGrave, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Bony Pony, Kelsey Gillespie, Rike Mangor Jensen, Taylor Payne, Rachel Mobbs, Megan Moon, Alicia Chapman, Riley Kidess, Laurel Happy, Ross Ann Batamana, Eric Butler, Miranda, Miranda Landon Schwausch, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Shanley, Darcy Alexander Harrison, Sandra Rose, Kremnick Roberts, Andren Kaufman, Steve Trelor, Leo Nachum, Julia Buzak, Demi Lynn, Michelle Spurgeon, Callista Delano, Love Keshlonger, Jennifer Terzi, and Crystal Pollard, Henrique Wolf, Jeremy Elmore, Delkis, Katrina Smith, Jerrica Law, Casey Canales, Megan Stempen, Zat, Jack Skitzes, Sophia Lyon, Dane Nemcher, Rochelle Unitmaz, Kirsty, Robin Garcia, Chick Parm, Mermaid and her Daddykins, Aaron Ugas, Not My Daughter, You Biatch, Ilaria Vicentin, Lori, Gregory Hughes, Krista Lee, Caw Caw, Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalek, Ribbon Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, It's Definitely Ludo. Bagman, Ashley Somers, Grant Sohn, your friendly neighborhood Ravenclaw, Gavin Miller, Aliyah Elsar Shobi, Jack Parr, Serenity Allen, Emily Quinlan, Haley Hastings, Sabrina Casanova, Sean Allen, Jenny Browers, Laura, Ella Levy, Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, Kirsten R. Cunningham, Ann Peltzer, Nash Sanadiki, Brett Clausen, Hunter Gordon, Mary Price, Steamed Nuggets, and Kurt I. Potter. Web design by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamandas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash powderless, twitter.com slash powderless pod, instagram.com slash powderless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash powderless. For any and all information about the show, and transcripts, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com for bonus content. You can go to patreon.com slash potterless. And for merch, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether you reach out to someone directly or you tell somebody at a very safe, six feet apart social distance park meetup, hey, I listen to the show Potterless. I think you'd like it too. That would help me a lot. Or you could just leave a rating review online. That also helps. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as I say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on.